Hi church, I'm Deborah, one of the kids directors here at HH. Welcome to Virtual Sunday 2020. Wherever you're watching from, we hope that you find encouragement from today's service. First, if you have kids, we've created special programming for them. All you need to do is set them up on a phone or a tablet and head over to hamiltonhills.org backslash hhkids and click on the video. And FYI, there's a special surprise in the video, so be sure to ask them about that. Also, I want to let you know that there are several ways to give. You might be thinking about year-end giving. You can text to give at the number on the screen, or you can give online through our website. As always, you can mail a check to the church. Today is going to be really fun. Our staff hopes you enjoy this experience. I'm going to send you over to the Powell House, where a lot of our staff is right now. I'd like to wish everyone a happy new year. See you in 2021. Hey guys, welcome to the Powell House. We're here with Mama Powell, <laughs> Papa Powell, <laughs> and we got uh, Daniel, Pastor Randall, Pastor Mark. We're about to have breakfast. Uh, I'm assuming that you are also eating breakfast in your home. And uh, just like maybe you do with your family, we're going to spend some time talking about the new year and all the ups and the downs. It's been uh, uh, quite, quite a crazy year. So join us. Hey, can you be quiet? Because this food's looking Matt. really good. We need, we need <laughs> this. She uh, made it's warm, them homemade. homemade? Like, homemade? The, they're not from like the store, man. They're, like, she bombs? rolled the... All right, who's going first? I mean, I'll, I'll go first. Come on, Mama. Hook me up. <laughs> what you want, baby boy? Uh, you know I want a little bit of it all. I didn't get this size by not eating. <laughs> I hope everybody's jealous by looking at this. Yeah. yeah. Okay. I can't lie. I, I snuck a biscuit you already. A biscuit? I don't know how much we're going to get accomplished, especially with Randall, uh, <laughs> during this segment here. But So we where I'm from, you open up the biscuit and put the gravy on it. Okay, I'm down with that. We probably shouldn't even oh. mic'd up Randall because he's just going to be eating. What is that you're putting on my plate? This is egg casserole. Okay, yeah. It's got egg and cheese and Yeah, ham. I want that. Make sure there's bacon on there. Bacon? Yeah, you can't go without bacon. I feel like you can talk to your mom like nobody else. Well, yeah. Yeah, you just kind of say, give me this. <laughs> I have been so tempted, like, for 30 minutes to just stick my head in the gravy. <laughs> Thank you, Mom. Math right snacks. Math hey, snacks. and uh, Pastor Gary will make you a pancake, and there's Ooh. bananas, oh, there's word. salted caramel, there's pecans, oh, there's blueberries, oh. there's chocolate chips. Thank you, Lord. Yeah. I feel like I'm in a cooking show right now. <laughs> can you say hallelujah? <laughs> Paula Dean Powell. So let's talk a little bit about uh, this year. Uh, it's hard to believe it's the last Sunday of the year and kind of all the things that transpired a little bit. January we had, I mean, obviously there was no COVID-19 going on yeah. and we literally had uh, the most people we've ever had on our campus. It was a celebration of life service. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Obviously sad uh, that it was under those circumstances, but 30, 40 people came to Christ wow. in a service and over 2,000 people on our campus for one. It's hard to even say that, like that would never yeah. happen at any other time during this year. Yeah. It was a great thing too, because it was, uh, became a local outreach. Even students uh, after that funeral that uh, reached out were having the same thoughts and really saved several students' lives just having that service. So yeah. Yeah. thank you. Bless you. And then I feel like I don't really remember a whole lot until March. <laughs> I feel like that's almost like where the oh years gosh, is a little blur. Yeah. I remember having to um, borrow people's minivans to use the church across the street's parking lot. Oh, yeah, so for that. So we could bring people over mm -hmm. to that. Yeah. Yeah, that was incredible. And then, you know, with, when COVID-19 hit, I mean, I feel like we just had to, like, turn everything on its head. Um, you know, we started going virtual. It felt like there was like one week where it was just like, okay, we can't meet together anymore. So we just, we have to turn everything on its head and go virtual that week. Yep. We were all sitting in the same office, like our whole staff, I think there was like 12 or 13 of us in one little so office nice. together. We we're all sitting down, almost like in like disbelief of like, okay, this is actually yeah. gonna happen. Like we're not gonna be meeting this Sunday. I can't remember the last time I haven't been on campus at a church during 
a Sunday service. Hey, time out. Why would you give Randall a cinnamon roll and not me? Because he's, <laughs> you're, gonna, you're gonna get one, but then, Mr. Greedy. You don't just get special store. treatment because you're her son. There, there's I, yours. Gotta go in line. These are homemade, man. <laughs> <laughs> I still can't get over it. Most people would just buy it from the store and pretend they made it. <laughs> Not Mama Bev. It's, it's all homemade. Are they, are they getting the chewing on the mic? I'm a little nervous about the chewing on the mic. <laughs> <laughs> I, hope, I hope they hear the chewing on the mic. Yeah. Be jealous. This yeah. is some good food right here. Man, one of my highlights was those care packages that we started doing. Mm -hmm. You remember those? Tell us a little bit about those, Matt. Yeah, I, I, uh, I remember just trying to think through the details of like, how do we do this, stay safe while doing it and then how do we get all the requests in so we created a care portal through care at hamiltonhills.org uh, our deacon team came through in a huge way uh, during that kind of getting the requests in filtering all the requests we had people that uh, had lost their job because of covid they had lost family members mm -hmm. because of covid um, and then uh, the church some of it virtually, but then also uh, not virtually, just being the hands and feet of Jesus, people giving of their time, people mm -hmm. giving their money. Uh, it just, it was so cool to see the church be the church mm -hmm. in that moment. Right. It, I was just glad to be a part of it. I remember taking one of those care packages to some of our uh, elderly, uh, one of our elderly families. Yeah. And the guy had just, um, he just, fallen and broken his leg and they actually said they had been praying because they were running out of groceries oh that's yeah. right i do remember that one yeah, yeah. wow mm -hmm. yeah and we didn't know we, we didn't know no i also remember the uh because we had to go virtual like we had all this equipment we were missing and that was interesting too like, yeah we i mean I think it's a testament to people's faithfulness and their giving that we were able to purchase like the equipment. We weren't ready to go broadcast our services like we're doing now. And I mean, we kind of got thrust into that, but man, because of people's giving, we were just able to purchase the equipment needed. And yeah. you know, that, now unfortunately, it's a little bit of a new norm. Um, hopefully get back to where that's not the norm anymore, but you know. Do you guys remember the live lobby? Yeah. Oh, the loud yeah. lobby, yeah. I don't know if many people know this, or even at home if you know this, but like, there was, I think like one of the first weeks, we didn't know that the audio was on, and we were just joking around. <laughs> we were like, wait, I hope we didn't say anything that we shouldn't have said. This oh, segment man. could have easily been bloopers and what not to do <laughs> during a pandemic. But, yes. I guess uh, one of my things were when we had that care team and how many people stepped up in our church, yeah. like right away. It was so, it, it encouraged me. Um, I'll never forget where I was when I realized, oh my goodness, we are totally being locked down in, in a house. And then how do you have church? How do you minister to all these people? Automatically thought of our elderly. Mm -hmm. Like how in the world do we get to our elderly? And we're still trying ways to to reach out to them because they're still kind of on lockdown. But it was really encouraging to me how God and His sovereignty had put together even a team and was forming it. I know we didn't have the money or didn't have a production room or even um, the, the guys and gals behind the cameras right now, but God was bringing them to our church and He knew what was going to happen. He wasn't surprised. And that was encouraging to me was uh, from Daniel and his team and even Brian, who many of you probably don't know because he's always behind the camera with the headphones on but how God brought him and his family to our church and just at the right time. So in the midst of all this, it's been really encouraging to see how God has just worked. Yeah. yeah. Oh, man. Hey, hey, Mark, do you remember um, one of my favorite parts of the year was when we, you, I think you wrote the prayer. It was a prayer that we went to different people's houses and shot a video from like, some of the youngest people in our church to some of the oldest. Yeah. I just remember like, like the unity that was needed during that time and the community that was needed. And then I think God helped you to write a prayer that I mean, I got emotional every time I watched it um, just from, you know, watching the youngest to the oldest read that prayer in community with each well, other. Well, let's just say this. Uh, Matt didn't really even believe I wrote the prayer, <laughs> but I, I do have that in me every once in a while. So I actually did write the prayer. It's true. Uh, but yeah, that was a sweet time. I think God, pressed upon my heart 
I do, we look for so many ways to uh, try and combat our anxieties and our fears. Yeah. And he really pressed upon my heart how important it is to pray because prayer is the work. And uh, that was a moving time, a very moving time. Speaking of that care team, I also remember uh, we had an elderly, we had three or four elderly people in our church that didn't have any access to internet yeah. or mm-hmm. access to uh, a smartphone or anything like that. So we had someone on our care team that would create a DVD for them every single week and bring that DVD um, uh, every single week to them. That was, that was another, just one little example, too, of the right. church being the church. That was awesome. The, um, Randall, speak about some of the connection groups and stuff in the Rooted. I mean, I feel like that was... Yeah, Randall, speak about it with your mouth full. <laughs> this food is so good. Like... Are you Those of you watching, you can't, <laughs> you can't imagine how great this is. <laughs> this is really one of my favorite times. Yeah, our groups, um, when, the, when the pandemic hit, uh, one of the things that, that I really believe God gave us the wisdom to know uh, even how to do, even where to begin, was we got all of our group leaders together, Pastor Mark, and we told them, like, you're going to be one of the biggest vital factors and our church remaining a church, and our church yeah. being the church. And we just instructed them to uh, love their group members, to shepherd their group members. And I, I've never been in a church where the, the leaders responded and took something so serious. And because of that, yeah. um, we actually have had um, growth, not, not only spiritually, but our, our groups have grown numerically because people got behind that vision that this is how we will take care of one another. Right. During a global pandemic, yeah. they grew. Right. It's been incredible. Unreal. Um, I think one of the highlights for me, too, was actually probably, uh, Mark, you were talking about this, kind of one of the lows that led to one of the highs is having to stare at a camera for 11, was it 11, 12 weeks where we were just completely not on campus at all. Right. Yeah, I spoke, I think, 11 weeks in a row with a camera and poor Brian and Michaela who helped me. <laughs> and pre-recorded it. Man, we pre-recorded that. I think that was probably the lowest time during the COVID-19 for me was being in an empty room and then staring at a camera and trying to give God's message across the camera. But it was 11 weeks for me and then I said, I'm done, Matt, you're doing it for, for <laughs> it a couple was, weeks. It's tough. It was tough. That yeah. is a tough thing to do. Mm-hmm. And then, uh, we got back on campus. What was the, how many did we have that first service that we were back on campus? I think it was like five. Five people? <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> it was, what was, that, was that worse than speaking to a camera? Or? I, it it kind of was. It was. I was like, can I go back to the camera? Can it, let's just not bring five people in. Oh, man. Yeah, it was hard, too, because people are, and by nature, they, they get excited with other people. And then you only bring five people in. But I'll tell you, it's something that God prepared me for from those 11 weeks just reminding me it's about me being faithful to the Lord and it's about us not worried about a crowd, but us being faithful and honoring and glorifying the Lord. So I came to the realization if five people come, 500 people come, I think I'm more comfortable now than ever that whoever comes, God's there, he's going to show up and there's amazing things that are going to happen. Yeah, I also remember with the creative team, the worship team, when we did get to come back together, it was such a celebration because yeah. we missed each other so much. And it was like, man, it, the church is so needed when it comes to community too. I mean, uh, and they just, they just love being together. And so that was really cool to see. And then after like 11 weeks of uh, staring at a camera and then five, 10 people, 15 people, I, I remember that's kind of all culminated back to, I know things aren't back to normal, which I guess we've talked about, man, I hope they don't ever go back to normal, normal, I hope yeah. the church continues to be the church by being the hands and feet. But having that celebration Sunday was just such an awesome reminder. I remember sitting there taking in all of these statistics of what God did yeah. while we were in a global pandemic, while there's anxiety, while I was wondering, you know, what is going to happen right. during this year? And then going through some of those, I mean, like, I know we already talked about it, but like 400 people in groups and, yeah, our you know, rooted, our rooted experience, uh, uh, over 200 people including teenagers. Yeah. How many students was it? Um, just going back to the 40. basics of... 40. Yeah. Just going back to the basics of like what it means to live our life for Christ. And uh, I just got an email yesterday from uh, a group leader talking about 
how his group is so ready for the new year yeah. and like being being the church and wanting to be more active yeah. in their faith. So We had like 11 baptisms and then we just added two more a couple of Sundays ago. Mm -hmm. I mean, just just unbelievable. I, I had forgotten self-admittingly that, that God had done just so many right. neat things. I mean, and then like the financial giving of, of everybody staying consistent and, yeah. and uh, yeah, just unreal. I think that celebration and that gratitude towards Jesus is one of the ways we just beat back the enemy too. Yeah. When we stop and celebrate what God is doing in our lives, it's so, so easy just to gloss over the year and or call the year a loss, but yep. it's so important for us to celebrate those things. I think celebration right now is becoming counterculture. Yeah. And I almost feel like Christians need to celebrate more. And uh, we're going through hard times, but the celebration of God's people, praise that brings glory to God, uh, I think is so important in this time. So I, ho I hope we stay counterculture in that sense of celebrating that uh, what God has done. But it's been awesome. Been awesome to see. I don't think I'd want to redo 2020. No. Uh, but I'm thankful that we have gone through what we've gone through and seen God in some mighty ways. Um, I feel like it's going to launch us into 2021 yeah. in a great way. You know, an interesting stat that just came out, I think it's important to share. It is a stat. It wasn't a, a Christian poll, but it was a poll asking people about how they felt about their lives. And there was one segment of people in society that felt better in 2020 than worse. And it was those who went weekly to church. That was interesting to me, and I know we are, are all at different places in this pandemic and in this world, but it was interesting to me that one segment of society was those who weekly, not attended church or connected to church, those who continue to go weekly to church feel better about themselves. And I think that's something to be said, and I, I love technology and I love the, that we're able to reach people like this, but just assembling with God's people, whether it's two people, right. five people, or hundreds of people. Yeah, I... That's interesting though. Well, we probably should stop making people so jealous with this. We're gonna move to the living room in a second, right? Mm -hmm. um, so we're gonna actually show a couple minute video here, just a celebratory video, some of our other favorite highlights of the year. Mama Bev, thank you so much thank for you. cooking awesome. all this. this was... Before we go over there, I, I need some more biscuits and gravy. <laughs> please, please. please. Yeah. I saw the secret. Um, to the gravy. Uh, I'll have to kill you. But, uh, I'll say it kill you. I would never <laughs> say it on camera. I'm just saying. I'm You're sorry. a spoiler. <laughs> my, you would say my, life is, <laughs> my life has changed forever. <laughs> All right, guys. Well, we're going to wrap this up, but uh, check out this video of some of the best moments of the year. Every Jesus follower should be thanking, go make disciples. What's great about church is compassion happens not when you write a check. Compassion happens not when you find a church with the right style. Compassion happens when we understand that the number one priority of a Jesus follower is to tell and show the good news of Jesus Christ. And when that happens, lives will be changed for eternity. When we're so consumed of what's going on here, it blinds us from thinking that one day we aren't going to be here. And the person that we love and the Jesus that we worship and serve, we will be spending an eternity with him not here. And not for the time on earth, but now living towards eternity. Do you know what the purpose of Hamilton Hills Church is? It's to make disciples, but more importantly, it's to protect the gospel. We are people as called out by God as his followers that gather together as his family. Our number one priority is to protect the gospel because if the gospel is watered down, then we have no eternal hope.
Jesus has an open door policy. He says, come to me, all of you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take up my yoke and learn from me, because I'm lowly and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. My wife, she, she just rolls her eyes and laughs at me because I'll start laughing out loud. I have my phone in my hand. You think I'm on Instagram or something. I'm actually on the neighborhood app. That's how I just get joy. Uh, they took a picture of a cat on their porch outside in the snow and said, whoever's cat this is should have it taken away because it's going to freeze to death. And then someone underneath said, well, why don't you just open your door? <laughs> oh. I love the neighborhood app in Fishers, Indiana. Oh my gosh, if that was you, Jesus loves you. This is our online experience, so thank you for being here. If you're brand new, give us a little wave emoji in the comment section. Or a thumbs up. Or a thumbs up. Uh, if we do bad, don't do the thumbs down just only thumbs up. I just want to say on behalf of our church, thank you for what you do. Thank you for being a part of a, the community that cares. Um, I know it's hard work. Some of you even teach, uh, I, I watched a video not too long ago of two-year-olds on Zoom. I didn't even know that was possible. Uh, uh, all the way up to high schoolers and beyond and then uh, working in the medical field, you put your, um, your health on the line every day. And we as a church family, we're, we just want you to know we care about you, we're thinking about you, and we're praying for you. The gospel ministry you and I are called to is the good work. God is not going to quit working in and through us until Jesus comes back. One of my favorite things uh, since we've returned back to in-person gatherings has been having live worship. Wasn't that awesome? Yeah, it was great. Uh, my dream is to one day be able to have hair like Jacob Powell, uh, the drummer, and then Mike Goudreau. They look like they belong, like God has just gifted their hair to be on a worship team. It's just incredible, uh, and I'm super, super jealous. And it's awesome to see guests again this week. We're glad that you're here, part of our service, as well as many of you, you're back. Uh, now we know how to get you back. Just offer free child care. Come on, somebody. And 1 John chapter 4, verse 19, it says that we love because He first loved us. You see, when we were unlovable and we, we, we were far away from God, He loved us so much that He made a point to do everything He could to make Himself known that we might have an opportunity to be saved. We started a thing called care at hamiltonhills.org. It's an email where it was like a one-stop shop for those that needed help and uh, those that needed, or, or maybe somebody that knew somebody that needed help during this time and during this national pandemic. We had 86 requests come in and through the giving of our people and the faithfulness of God and the faithfulness uh, of you reaching out and serving during this time, all 86 requests were met. Can you give God a hand for what he did? Isn't that awesome? I believe there was five or six people who accepted Jesus Christ as their Savior in the last two weeks uh, through the weekend services. And yeah, let's give them a hand. And I'm so thankful for what God is doing and wants to do. Because of you, we have not stopped supporting not a single one of our missionaries during the pandemic because of your giving. I pray for these elders. I pray that you would guard our heart. I pray that we would live humbly with each other. 
and with you. I pray that your spirit would go before us. And we'd live lives of authenticity. So Charlie, upon your public profession of faith in Christ, I baptize you, my sister, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, buried with him in baptism, and raised to walk in newness of life. Isn't that awesome? Good job, Charlie. I now baptize you, my brother, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, buried with him in baptism, raised to walk in newness of life. I want everyone to know that Hamilton Hills is fulfilling God's mission. I want everyone to know that we are broken, we are messy, and we have issues, but we know who Jesus is, and we want to share what He's done in our life today. Every time we've been 20 20 that we get excited, we go, all right, that's an interruption. That means that God is ready to do something through me to show compassion and be like Jesus and be a light in this world. Hey everybody, thanks for tuning in. That video you just saw, it's just a reminder of how God and His grace is through all seasons of life. I'm so glad that you joined us today. We're in the Powell family room with some of our staff and family. The breakfast was awesome, was it not? I am sad that you could not eat breakfast with us, but then I'm not because then you would eat some of mine. So we're glad you're not here, but we wish you were here, I guess you would say. So the last Sunday of the year, it's hard to believe, uh, 2020, the last Sunday, Everybody in this room, you got all your goals fulfilled for 2020. Am I right? Yeah. I even bet you at home, you're thinking, man, I was able to mark off every goal that I did for 2020. Said no one. Uh, I think 2020 has been a year like no other. Uh, everybody in this room and those watching have been impacted greatly by 2020. There is nobody on planet Earth that has ever felt the way that you and I are feeling during this pandemic. I mean, so much stuff happened. Pandemic, election, so much stuff. You know, I started thinking in my own life, and maybe you guys could probably say the same thing, that I battled anxiety throughout this season. Uh, anxiety has always been there with people's lives, even through Scripture. We're going to see that today. But battling anxiety has become something really real in my life in 2020. You know, I started studying scripture and I thought, what in the world could I say and us talk about on the last Sunday of this year? And I thought over and over again, talking real, dealing with the words anxiety, fear, depression. You know, I started thinking in scripture, like who could I look to that had to really battle anxiety when it came to being a Jesus follower and doing great things for God. I look no further than in the New Testament in following the Apostle Paul and his ministry. If you know the story of the Apostle Paul, you know how he was Saul became Paul. He was converted into Christianity. And there's a long, rich history with Paul in, in him reaching so many people for Christ. In fact, I believe that we have the gospel today in North America because of the efforts of Paul and the people that he led. When you think of Paul, you don't think of anxiety. You think of warrior. You think of someone bold. You think of someone who just, uh, you wish you could be, but you know you never will be. But then you really dabble into Paul's life, and it's really noticeable that he had to battle fear and anxiety. You talk about a man who had to stand alone with Jesus Christ. You talk a man that had to be bold in his faith and no one around him. You talk about Paul. But then we sometimes think when we read characters in the Bible, I don't know how you are, but I know me, like they're not human. But then you really read about them and they're just as human as me and you. And I thought the last Sunday of the year, I would come to you in your family room, to this family room, and then talk to even you guys in here to encourage you that the word has encouraged me. 
that there has been no time in history of mankind where mankind has not had to battle anxiety and fears in life. I think of a story of Paul that really sums this up greatly, and it's in Acts chapter number 16, where he had to fight against anxiety. In Acts chapter number 16, Paul, Silas, Luke, and Timothy, they were coming to the European area for the first time. They made their way to Philippi, and then there was the ruins of the city included the main highway of the Roman Empire, an outdoor theater that once held 3,000 or more people. It was just an amazing feature. It's empty and ruined. Then he came to a scene to where Paul heals a child in the name of Jesus. And her owner trumped up some charges against the stranger for ruining their little demonic money maker. And when the owner got upset that he healed that child, him and Silas were thrown in prison. They were thrown in prison. I want you to think about this. They were coming to this region because God called them to spread the gospel, push back darkness in the light. And here they find in this moment where they're thrown in prison, not just thrown in prison, the text in Acts chapter number 16 says they were beaten, they were tortured. And then there's this scene in Acts chapter 16 where at midnight, at midnight, uh, Paul and Silas start singing praises to the Lord. You know, if you think about that, Paul had a choice. You think about this, even sometimes, I'm ashamed sometimes to admit it, and you all should agree with me. I'm just kidding. But uh, uh, we all uh, think this way sometimes, where either we're compelled to, where you do something for Christ, and it doesn't turn out the triumphant way. It turns out with more trials, and you go, what in the world? God, I stood up for you. Uh, God, I honored you. God, I was doing right in my relationships. And God, I was trying my best to rear my children. And now my children turn their back. Whatever the situation is, there is a quick uh, thought in your head to start questioning God. And in most people's lives, it ruins their Christianity because they go down this uh, path of questioning God, fear, anxiety, the what ifs in life. And so many things that are out of their control. And in this passage of scripture, I thought it was neat that Paul had a choice. And that choice was to have anxiety about what was going to happen with his life. Or at midnight when there was no hope, he was shackled. And him and Silas started singing praises to the Lord. Why, why do I mention that? He was thrown in prison. He took a beating. He was hungry and had to be in despair. But at midnight, he sung praises to God and glorified God. I, I want you to listen to this statement because I think it's encouraged us all because it really encouraged me greatly. Paul chose to rejoice at all times and said no to anxiety. From a practical aspect, this is one of the most obvious reasons that Paul had such a successful career when it came to Jesus Christ. I believe practically one of the reasons that Paul was able to do so much that he was is he did not give in to fear and he did not give in to anxiety. Doesn't mean it didn't come on his doorstep. It didn't mean that there wasn't things like the pandemic in his life. In fact, I don't have time to read this all to you, but he was shipwrecked three times. He was beaten. He was left for dead. He was in prison. He had, many people wanted to murder him, and he had a choice. He could say, hey, I did everything I could for God. Now it's someone else's time, right? right. Or he could say, no, God has a plan. He has a purpose, and he has me right here, right now. And all I can do in my life is choose to glorify God. Um, Never did Paul show that way more clearly. That night, he and Silas sang in the bottom of the prison, bleeding, bruised, broken in life, that they were going to choose God over anxiety. I think today I really want to get across to you that you can say no to anxiety. I know critics will say to me, there's different people who can and can't. And I agree there's complications and everybody's story is different. But overall, I believe spiritually speaking that everyone has a choice to say no to anxiety. Here, here's something I want you to get, and then we'll read scripture. I, I really want the record to show this. The record shows in Acts chapter number 16 that an earthquake broke the chains and gave Paul and Silas freedom. If you know that passage of scripture, an earthquake came after they sang praises to God. But here's all I want to say to you. I believe that Paul and Silas were already free spiritually before there was ever an earthquake or a chain broken off their wrist or feet. I believe that they were already in spiritual freedom because they chose not to relate their life to a circumstance. They chose to relate their life to an almighty God that was in control in the midst of no matter what circumstance. 
And so as you look at Paul, I believe he was already free. And can I say this to you? I don't know when the pandemic's going to end. I don't even know if the pandemic will ever end. But I do know this. You and I can be free because we're not free because of circumstance. We're free because we choose God over anxiety. And, and here's why I believe that Paul gives the formula of choosing God over anxiety. Years later in the book of Philippians, and if you want to turn there, you can. Uh, we just had breakfast, so some of us don't have our Bibles. Can you believe that? They work for a church. Come on, people. No, but in all reality, in Philippians chapter 4, years later, Paul actually gives the formula of why he could choose God over anxiety. I love Philippians 4 and Philippians 4 and verses 4 through 7. And I'm going to ask some people to read the scripture. First, I'm going to ask Denise to read Philippians 4 and verse number 4. Verse number 4, rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice. I wrote this statement down. I love that verse that Denise just read. And I think all of us, if you've been a Christian for any length of time, have probably heard this or you've heard someone say, hey, choose Lord, the Lord, rejoice in the Lord. Um, write this statement down if you're watching. Think of this statement. Choose to rejoice no matter the circumstance. I believe the first thing Paul determined in his life was he was going to choose to rejoice no matter the circumstance. Notice what it says, rejoice. Any of us can sing and rejoice when things are good. Uh, we could sit here today and we have uh, Gary with us. He could lead us in singing right now. Uh, we have a piano in this room, a guitar. We don't even need that in here. We have some music, talent, a legend, Pastor Gary Powell right here. Man, it would be easy right now. We just had the best breakfast ever in the state of Indiana. And we have people who could lead us in singing, and it would be really easy to sing praises to God right now. But you know what I believe the world is looking for? For people that really believe in God that they can sing and rejoice in a prison cell where they don't know what their future holds. And Paul could say that because he could really tell of his experiences that there was times when he said, I choose to rejoice over anything else. So choose to rejoice. It's both good news and bad news that in the hour of difficulty, people are watching and listening more than ever to know in your faith in Christ is genuine. You know, something really convicted me. Um, I read an article the other day in New York Times, and I like to read a lot of news in the morning. I look at the religious section, and, and there was an atheist that was a guest uh, of this religious section of the New York Times, I believe it was. And he wrote, um, the title was, You're No Different Than Me, I Believe. And he said, I would actually maybe think of believing in Christianity if they didn't respond to life like me. Boy, that was convicting. Yeah. It, it gets me emotional because I think Christianity today has come to a point that's so circumstantial that even me as a follower of a Christ who gives his life to preach the gospel sometimes responds to life like someone who doesn't know Jesus. In good or bad, this world is looking to us to go, hey, will they still rejoice? And Paul tells us, choose to rejoice no matter the circumstance. You you're only will be able to rejoice in a difficult hour. I wrote this down, and I think this is important. You'll only be able to rejoice in a difficult hour if your relationship with God is real. Is real. Here's what I mean by that. Your relationship with God isn't dependent on a pastor, a parent, a child, a church, it's do you have intimacy with Jesus Christ yourself? And man, we all go up and down. This year has been an up and down. If a pastor tells you they were on a high with Jesus Christ every day this year, let me say this boldly, they are a liar, run from them. <laughs> all of us are human, just like Paul had those days, but he chose to rejoice. Here's a second thing, and I'm gonna have Randall read this in Philippians chapter four. I'm gonna have you read verse four again, but I want him to go through verse seven. So listen to Randall read this, the scripture. Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Mm. That is a very rich set of verses. 
I even love what he says because he's talking years later to these people and he's saying, be anxious for nothing. Uh, the, the version I read says, don't worry about anything. And he was saying that and he was teaching them how. Uh, rejoice how? In your own strength? Rejoice how? In your circumstance? No, he says, rejoice in the Lord always. And Paul writes in Philippians uh, 4, a moment later, he gives us a fourfold reminder to pray about the things you need. And I think this is important to read. He says this, in everything, Paul writes, by prayer and petition, we don't know how to pray today. We leave prayer to the, the last resort instead of the first response. And so he says this, prayer, petition, thanksgiving, present your request. And then the last is to God. I love this statement. And the peace of God, Paul says, and this is what Paul was saying, will be like an armed sentry marching around your heart and your mind, literally fighting anxiety for you. So here's the next statement that I believe in the formula. Secure your foundation in Christ alone. People let you down. Government for sure will let you down. Can I get an amen with everybody in the house? Uh, people let you down. Church lets you down. Uh, this world will let you down. And Paul is reminding them, secure your future in Christ alone. There's a little background I want to give, and I know it'll take a little bit more time, but I really want to just read what I wrote because I think this could be powerful to everyone uh, listening. Philippi was a city populated in part by a large number of retired Roman soldiers. The background of this text is important. Like any military community, Philippi would have known the lingo of the armed services and would have quickly embraced the image of the armed sentry. Around their city would have been soldiers who stayed up all night to guard their gardens from rabbits, their homes from thieves, and their land from enemy attack. So listen to this. To guard the city, in the Greek in this verse, the word was phreo. So in other words, in this letter to military families, Paul says that God's peace will be your phreo. He was saying, hey, rejoice in me and don't be anxious for anything. Come to me. Give me your petition. Pray and then put your trust in God. And then he says, guard your hearts. And he was using the lingo of that day. And he was saying, I'll be your fray re o." You see, often we do not get to uh, feel that presence of God because prayer is our last resort instead of our first response. Get inside of God's city walls, so to speak, and God's peace will march like a sentry around your potential anxieties, is what he was saying. Let me be your fray re oh. Let me guard your city of the heart. Let me guard the city of the mind. Let me guard the city of your circumstance. Let me guard the city of your family. Let me guard the city. You come to me and you put your life under my power and under my presence and under me, then I will take care of being your fray re o fray re um, And here's the last statement. Then I'll have Sandy read some verses. Develop the discipline of saying no to anxiety. So this is the hardest part, right? So develop the discipline of saying no to anxiety. But Paul gives us this in the text. This is not nearly as complicated as we often make it because it's simply saying I reject going into my emotions of anxiety and fear, and I choose to go a different path. Now, that's as simple as the formula is, but it's so difficult. Everybody perfect when it comes to that? Uh, no. Um, if you'd like to stop being anxious, you'll have to intentionally think about other things. Let me say that again. If you would like to stop being anxious about your situation, you will have to intentionally think about other things. Thanks. I think that's important. And then Paul shows us in verses 8 and 9, this will take amount of great discipline. But Paul was crystal clear in his instructions on developed discipline of saying no to anxiety. So Sandy, would you read verses 8 through 9? Yeah. And now, dear brothers and sisters, one final thing. Fix your thoughts on what is true and honorable and right and pure and lovely and admirable. Think about things that are excellent and worthy of praise. Keep putting into practice all you learned and received from me, everything you heard from me and saw me doing. Then the God of peace will be with you. So good. I want you to notice in that text and in, 
in verse number eight, the end in my, my version says, dwell on these things. Think on these things. Paul here was not some guy with theory going, hey, when circumstances come, no, this guy had the worst of circumstances. Being almost hung, being almost murdered, being shipwrecked, you name it, Paul had to deal with it. He says, think on these things. Listen, listen to this statement. Can, can any of you kind of relate to this? How many anxious thoughts about rumors that aren't true have ruined otherwise perfectly good days? In 2020, I can't tell you, I'm just going to admit, confess our sins right here to our church, that there's been many days in 2020 I was paralyzed because I chose to think and lean into my anxiety instead of choosing intentionally to lean into Christ and who He is in my life. And none of those things even came true. There was times, I'll tell you, you've heard the story, you heard it a minute ago at breakfast, that uh, 11 weekends in a row, I, I was telling God I would drive home from church, you know, I felt bad for Brian and Michaela uh, videoing and, and stuff. I'm like, man, I have to do that over again. Man, I didn't say that right. I was so anxious in those moments. I would drive home from church and I would go, God, really, this is what I was called to? I thought I was called to people, not a camera, right? Uh, I thought I was called to people, not this. And, and then he just had to remind me. He had to overwhelm me. Hey, this is about me and you and intimacy. Here's something that I was told by a mentor a long time ago. God didn't call anyone to ministry. He called everyone to intimacy. And out of the overflow of intimacy, we have natural ministry. So it's the same thing that in 2020, uh, how many anxious thoughts about rumors that aren't true have ruined otherwise perfectly good days. Think only on things that are true. So here we end in the family room at the Powell's house with a dynamite breakfast. I'm going to take a nap after this. It's the last Sunday of the year. And Paul says this, refuse to give in to anxiety. Think on these things. Think on what's noble. Think on it. What's noble? Think on it. If I could challenge you for 2021, instead of goals, let's do something new. Let's, let's be counter uh, culture for a minute. Instead of goals, what should we be ready to think on for 2021? Think on something noble. Think on something true. Think on something pure. Uh, use Philippians chapter number four, verse eight and nine as your life verses for 2021. Instead of us trying to be successful all the time, instead of us trying to be successful Christians, why don't we turn this around and say, I am determined to be a useful Christian. A Christian that rejects anxiety because my home is not in this world. My home is with Jesus Christ for eternity. And He's never promised me a good life here. He promised me a good life with Him for all eternity. So think on those. What about what's right? What about what's pure? That leaves out things that are wrong and impure and come to think about it that would be good move for any of us to make. Think of the lovely. Think of the admiral. Think of the excellent. Think of the praiseworthy. May, you may shock your families. You may shock your friends if all year in 2021 you said, I refuse to think on anything or allow anything to come out of my mouth that the enemy can use that's not praiseworthy. I'm going to praise more than point out the negative. I'm going to praise more than point out the, the things that they didn't do right. I'm going to praise my husband. I'm going to praise my wife. I'm going to praise my children when they're asleep, right? I'm going to praise all those things instead of be the one that has to point out the negative. Praiseworthy. Then I want to end with this, and I, I kind of wrote this down. I believe that that is what got Paul past some tough times when being an ambassador for Jesus. Paul had to determine that he was going to think on these things instead of the anxieties that would come up. Go back with me to that story in Acts chapter number 16. He was sitting in a prison. Anybody felt that way? 2020, I felt like a whole prison. I still feel that way. And who knows what 2021 will bring? But man, maybe God used this year to really get us to turn our way of thinking in our Christian lives upside down. Paul did not have some superpowers that we don't have. Paul served the same Jesus that I served and you served. And it was things like this that really set Paul apart that he was able to spread the gospel throughout all the world. Why? because he refused to give in to anxiety and fear. Instead, he gave his life over to Jesus. So in 2021, 
As I'm speaking and recording right now, the pandemic is not over. And can I tell you all something, me included, and this is bad news, even if the pandemic goes away, there's another one on the horizon because the Bible tells us the closer he gets to coming back, more wars will happen, more diseases will happen, more bad things will happen. So as Christians, let's use 2020 and say nothing's ever wasted. Nothing's ever wasted with Jesus Christ. We can be better Christians today because we refuse anxiety and fear and we choose Jesus. Going into 2021, I believe the thought should be say no to anxiety. Say no to anxiety. And let me address you watching us at home or wherever you're watching. I cannot relate to things you've been through in 2020. Nobody can in this room but you can't relate to things I've been through. You know, God did not call us to compare. He called us to be brothers and sisters together, lifting each other up, looking for that great hope, Jesus Christ. And I don't know where you're at end of the year. I don't know what you're thinking about 2021. I don't know what you're facing in your life, but I do know this. There is a Savior and His name is Jesus, and He loves you and He cares for you. And he's going to move right into life with you in 2021. But you have a choice to make. And that choice is you can dive into things of this world that go away. You can dive in and put efforts into relationships that can betray you, can use you, can walk away from you. Or you can be an ambassador for Jesus like the Apostle Paul and say, I refuse the negativity of my life. I refuse to focus on things I can't control. And I choose to rejoice and say no to anxiety. Does that mean anxiety is going to go away? No. Does that mean fear is going to go away? No. But every time it comes up, you make a conscious decision to say no to anxiety and yes to Jesus. 2021 will be a good year, not only for Hamilton Hills and for you individually. 2021 will be a good year, not because the pandemic goes away, but it'd be a good year if God's people choose right now before the first day of the year to say no to anxiety, yes to Jesus. Would you pray with me? Jesus, thank you for your word. Thank you that even in the midst of sorrow and in pandemics and and hardships, and the wanderings of life, that we can still have hope because you left us your word. And I pray right now, people watching, people listening, I pray that you would condemn the enemy in their life. I pray, dear Lord, like Paul singing in shackles, that they would realize they can be free even if their circumstance hasn't changed. And I pray that sorrow would be turned into joy as I'm speaking right now. And I pray, dear Jesus, that as we enter into 2021, that more than ever before, we'd be focused on choosing you instead of anxiety and fear. And we give you the glory in advance, expecting great things. May not be the way I think they're going to be, but I'm satisfied with the way that you're going to make them be. And we give you the glory in Jesus' name. Amen. What a great sermon that we just heard. And I hope that your hearts were encouraged like ours were. Um, as we go into the new year, we want to invite you to join us. We have 21 days of prayer coming up. And we also have our brand new series starting off the new year called In This House. On behalf of our family here at Hamilton Hills Church, we wish you and your family a happy new year. And we'll see you next year.